Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, July 15th, and we're going to hear the presentation, Regenerative Urbanism Rising Next Generation Practice. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call that 1-800 number shown. And for your content questions related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. And we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. And if you could please also indicate which speaker you would like to answer your question, that would be helpful. Coming up on your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2016. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. And today's uh, sponsor is the Sustainable Communities Division. And you can learn more about this division by going to planning.org slash divisions slash sustainable. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that in a moment. And uh, to learn more about our chapters, you can uh, visit planning.org slash chapters. So thanks to you for sponsoring. Uh, on your screen coming up is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these webcasts by visiting our webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just visit planning.org and log into your My APA account. Then up at the top, under Search for CM Activities, um, you can just type in the event number for today or the title of today's webcast, both of which can be found, again, on our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Uh, this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. And uh, for availability of that, again, webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, to receive uh, up-to-date information on our sessions. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just head over to youtube.com slash planning webcast, or you can just type in planning webcast as a search in YouTube. And we will have a PDF available after the presentation, again, on our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Okay, I'm now going to turn it over to Jennifer Koch, who's the secretary uh, treasurer of the Sustainable Communities Division, who's going to talk a little bit more about that and introduce our speakers and get us uh, all started today. So, Jennifer, it's all you. Hey, thanks, Chris. Let me just switch over here. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, as she said, the Sustainable Communities Division is sponsoring today's webinar, and um, our goal is to support planners who are working to integrate all aspects of sustainability into our work as planners and in related fields. And um, one way we do this is by coordinating webinars, but we also have other events and initiatives. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors for supporting all of the work that we've been doing. Uh, we have a great group this year. Um, please you know, thank them for their support of the division. Um, we're very grateful to them. Uh, if you'd like to get a hold of us, uh, here's our contact information. Like I said, the division has many ongoing initiatives. You can learn more about those on our website and on our social media accounts. Uh, we have a bi-weekly e-bulletin that you can sign up for on our blog site, which is listed on here, sustainableplanning.net. Um, and we also keep uh, you know, a list of opportunities for volunteering and upcoming events on our blog as well. So check that out. We are, you know, are already starting to plan for the conference in New York, unbelievably, um, and we have other several year-round things going on. So we'd love to get your input and assistance. Uh, for today, 
we are talking about regenerative urbanism. And so the discussion today is uh, centering on thinking about uh, the current sustainability challenge as sort of a need to pivot away from um, ad hoc greening and net negative mitigation toward net positive regenerative urban planning. Um, so you'll hear more about that idea and some case studies that illustrate the concept. Uh, we have three speakers today. Our first is, is Scott Edmondson, who is a strategic sustainability planner economist at the San Francisco Planning Department. Uh, Scott's recent work includes integrating living community, biophilic city planning and design, and strategic sustainability into San Francisco's planning, San Francisco planning's emerging sustainability planning program. Scott is uh, actually one of our Sustainable Communities Division uh, sustainability champions. Uh, Joshua Foss is uh, president at the Ecola Group, which is an international infrastructure design, development, and advisory firm whose innovation is making a new market guiding districts, cities, and entire regions beyond sustainability toward a regenerative future. Um, they've developed a restorative city standard for guidance about this and an integrated utility system as a primary vehicle to accomplish restorative city goals. Our final speaker will be Charles Kelly, who is an associate planner at ZGF Architects in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Charles is a senior architect and urban designer with more than 30 years of experience designing and planning high performance districts, and is the lead architect for ZGF Eco District and Urban Design Initiative in the US and international markets. So we have a great set of speakers. I'm looking forward to this session. I hope you all are too. Um, but we'll get started. So as Chris said, please type your questions as you think of them, and we'll be glad to discuss them after our speakers. Thanks. Scott, could you take yourself off mute? I think you might be uh, still muted there and we can't hear you. All right, can we hear now? We can hear you now. Excellent, sorry for the glitch. Um, so Josh and Charles and I are pleased to be here today to uh, walk through this presentation with you. Uh, we're going to cover a short introduction, go through uh, the necessary sustainability pivot, and view two cases that really illustrate this pivot in terms of planning restorative high performance places, take a brief reflection on the implications for planning, and open it up for discussion. Uh, Jennifer basically did this introduction, so I don't think we really need to do that. I'd um, just like to note that sort of the context for this work is the national APA's work uh, around this theme and, and initiative of sustaining places. And they're focusing on the comp plan as a major vehicle for advancing uh, community sustainability. They've got a PAS report on best practices, which is excellent, and <clears throat> um, I've been developing a whole work program around uh, how to implement sustainability at the comp plan level. And then this uh, work really involved um, work through the Sustainable Communities Division with this mission around an integrative approach, so planning as sustainability, not as a separate silo. And really a lot of the, the, the work and the work that we all face, but the division is really embracing is this need to develop an integrative framework for that approach. So today we hope to illuminate the challenge of sustainability in terms of restoring the planet and prospering, the need for this pivot from less bad to good, um, planning's emerging regenerative response, our method, which is really to recognize that response, to make the pivot, and to amplify the response, and to do that with a value proposition that involves leapfrogging to sustainability by leading sustainability by creating better places, which is what people value, and enabling that and paying for it through regenerative design and sustainable energy uh, and, and resource efficient systems. And recognizing that doing that is actually creating the built environment 
as a key part of the sustainable economy we need as the material basis for sustainability in a sustainable society and sustainable communities. And this session arose really from some work I did a few years ago um, related to the work we're doing in San Francisco, um, looking for effective approaches. And I found that the options were kind of limited. They were kind of limited to codifications of traditional planning, good environmentalism, lots of ad hoc greening, which is good, but not necessarily hooked up. And some of it was really more focused on strategic economic municipal development, attracting uh, those nimble tech firms that we all want these days. And there are lots of frameworks out there. One Planet, Living Building, Living Cities, The Natural Step, and of course, the darling of the day, um, Eco Districts has kind of been exploding onto the planning stage, both nationally and internationally. And out of this work, I, I discovered what, Charles, <clears throat> what Josh and, and Charles had been doing, and I recognized this theme of regeneration, and I really started exploring that in more detail and more depth with both Charles and Josh. And so given that, the, that this session arose out of an exploratory initiative, I want to invite all of you into that initiative as well um, in your own work. So the necessary sustainability planning pivot from net negative mitigation to net positive regeneration. If we look at current reality or existing reality, it's pretty clear we're facing end of industrial age challenges with a an array of deepening deficit trajectories. Um, this is more of a metaphorical slide. But we can probably sum that up in terms of five key trends that we face that will affect our planning and that we need to plan for. There's an unprecedented level of population growth, both the rate and level. We've got an economy that's in ecological overshoot. We have crashing global ecosystems. We're on a catastrophic business as usual climate change trajectory, and we've got increasingly fraying uh, society and growing inequality. And all of these trends are going to affect us directly or indirectly uh, in our local communities, and therefore we need to respond and, and prepare for them. Now these trends can't continue logically without crashing the biosphere. The exact trajectory over time and, and place will differ. Um, but it's not a good, good direction. So what do we do? Um, the option really is to address the source of the problem, which involves needing to invent an ecological economy, probably a, a critical mass of that within 20 years or so, um, at five times greater productivity and production that's environmentally decoupled with no negative impacts, and really attempting to generate an abundance for all. And I think if you push it a bit, these start to become the new minimum standards for uh, society. So the challenge is really to change course, to pivot to net positive. There's a role for this for, for everyone in all sorts of different sectors. But we're here today to really ask the question, what is planning's role? What's the role for planning in this exercise? And I think in terms of the core um, mission of our of our of our profession, it's really to provide, provide the leadership to capture this new value and to respond effectively to these daunting challenges. And to do that with innovation for regenerative urbanism, that's also a key component of the ecological economy, and more importantly, the transition to it. I've got some other points there, but I'm going to just leave those there for the future reading at the moment. So if we look at our, review our planning's end of industrial age challenges and, and the agenda that they create, fundamentally it's about creating a regenerative urban system as a core component of the ecological economy and sustainability. And we've got uh, two, four, six, seven kind of key um, tasks really that will change you know, particulars by place, but we find probably in all places. Around the world, we're going to need to build one new regenerative city of one million per week for 50 years to meet the population increase. We need to restore uh, existing aging infrastructure. We need to re-sculpt existing land use patterns around sustainability and, and sustainable urban systems performance. We need to refashion and enhance and activate great urban places. We need to really create oases of hardened regenerative cities 
to defend against the new climate extreme normals that we'll start experiencing increasingly in this century. And that cuts across a whole range of community, economy, and built environment dimensions. And with our planning to catalyze the ecological, economic development, and economy that we need as the basis for sustainability, and as part of all that, to really restore the natural capital and natural systems functions that we've lost over the last 200 years of industrialization and 10,000 years of agriculture. So those are the key tasks, the generic tasks that we face. So how do we actually do it? How do we respond? There's lots of innovation out there. There's lots of ideas and frameworks. It's kind of confusing to look at them all. Which one do you choose and why if you want to make a move? And there's two ways that I know of and that I've used to kind of cut through a lot of that confusion and to make some sense out of it. One is that definition matters, the definition of sustainability. It's always present. It's either implicit or explicit. And it defines and frames the problem and the resulting solution space. So if we proceed with unexamined definitions of sustainability, it, we may not be going in the direction that we need to and, and, and get to sustainability. So it's important to know which definition is in play, and it's important to even develop the definition that you need. Secondly, if you look out there, there are only two real differences of approach. There's the prevalent business as usual, traditional approach, which is net negative, do less damage. It's basically a false positive prosperity scenario. It's fundamentally degenerative, and it's on autopilot. And the key point here is to understand the consequences and requirements of these two differences. So we actually need to do something to get off this trajectory we're on. There's an emerging approach, which is the regenerative approach, which is net positive, do good, eliminate the negative impacts. We stop the systematic increase. But this is going to require invention. And that's really the challenge of our day, from my perspective. So how do you choose? You kind of match definition with the method and your purpose. There's you know, questions about what the definition would be for regenerative urbanism. What are we trying to accomplish? And then some strategic questions. Does the definition point us in the right direction? Does it lead to flexible platforms for future moves? And is the system's ROI, return on investment, greater than the silo ROI, or return on investment? Now, fortunately, <clears throat> we don't have to invent this regenerative approach. It is being invented now through the innovation that's bubbling up across our planning, design, and build professions. And you can recognize it in planning. We've got high-performance eco-districts, cities and regions, biophilic planning design, health and land use is being designed, lots of innovation going on. In the urban design field, you've got adding water and habitat to the urban design palette to create next generation places, and including biophilia in there. In architecture, we've had you know, for many years now the Architecture 2030 challenge around building efficiency. But now we're also looking at living buildings buildings and walls and roofs, and even passive houses, a new emerging uh, potential technology. In landscape architecture, there's the shift from ornamentalism to habitat cultivation as just a routine part of the practice in terms of biodiversity and creating biophilic uh, value as well. And in utilities, you know, we've had for years now this kind of this shift going on from gray to green infrastructure, but now you're hearing talk about living in infrastructure and even new concepts around urban metabolism. <clears throat> so there's lots of innovation going on out there. I'm sort of arguing that regeneration and re is, is the key theme of it. But I also want to point out that as much as there's a lot of innovation going out, on out there in, those, in our sort of practice silos, there's some hidden cross-silo potential, which if we're not aware of, we will never tap and exploit and, and use and create. And the example that I have here is really the example of Passive House, which is an energy efficiency standard that allows core building energy use to be reduced by 80 to 90 percent, which is pretty phenomenal. And in the whole energy renewable energy efficiency discussion, most of the time it's about technology, it's about buildings, et cetera. It's not really about planning. Um, but if we pursue this a bit, we see that it, it, the advantage here is that it enables on-site renewable uh, energy production to meet the building's needs. 
Um, but if we scale it across all buildings in a city, we start to create the built environment as a fundamental component of the no carbon economy that we need. And we really start adding a second function, uh, a second lineage function to the built environment of energy production, not just consumption. Now, if we do that, that dramatically enhances the value of building energy efficiency for society as a whole, and it really changes the value proposition. But we're not going to get there if we don't sort of see that, understand that, and figure out how to create the policies that really enable it and enable the, the sharing and production of that value. So this hidden cross silo potential is, is one of the um, one of the hidden values that comes from an integrative whole systems approach. So after all of this innovation, et cetera, that's going on, what are the prospects for actually creating a regenerative urban planning? I mean, it's not fully formed. It's, it's an emerging theme that has many threads. It needs to be invented. And the real question is, will we enable it? So today, we're going to explore two threads, kind of cases of work in progress of this pivot in Josh's work and in Charles' work. That's this pivot from net positive, net, net negative to net positive. And as we proceed and, and listen to Charles and, and Josh's work, to start thinking about the challenge of pivoting for ourselves and our city, the theme of regeneration in your practice in your city, you know, what kind of looks doable, what doesn't look doable, why and when, and, and really kind of embracing the challenge of how we could do the impossible, because at some point a lot of this stuff definitely looks impossible right now from here. And then also what really excites you and motivates you. So with that, um, we're going to transition into Josh's presentation on restorative urban development. And I'm going to pass the mic off to um, Josh right now. So Josh, take it away, please. All right. So I'm going to pull the screen up. And I trust that you guys can hear me now. So. Uh, yeah, thank you, Scott, for setting that fanta fantastic uh, foundation. We uh, really have responded to this need for the sustainability pivot at, at the Ecola Group. We have a, a public interest mission that's really focused on shifting urban innovation from this net negative incremental greening approach that Scott was talking about to the transformational net positive regeneration. So for the next several slides, you're going to hear a lot of sort of emphasis on some of these key words of systems-based, integrated, circular, and distributed. And and our sort of core message is to demonstrate that by utilizing this new approach, you can really leapfrog to higher levels of performance and actually achieve restorative outcomes. And along these lines, we were recently uh, invited and accepted into the Circular Economy 100, which is an international innovation platform that's led by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And this includes some of the most influential and forward-thinking organizations and municipalities in the world. And uh, we were invited as an emerging innovator which essentially is recognized as, as a company with a disruptive business model or service offering that can accelerate and scale the circular economy. And basically, the circular economy is designed to look at technical and biological uh, nutrients as uh, resources and close those loops. So uh, we're very excited to be a part of this program uh, for the next several years. Uh, so basically, our unique service offering, it's a turnkey approach to restorative city development. And these programs right here, as you can see on the screen, really encompass this turnkey approach. So uh, we have a Nexus integrated utility hub and an integrated utility system. They're essentially uh, high-performance integrated grid solutions. The Restorative Infrastructure Fund is a financial platform that supports these projects. And the Ecala Insights is a comprehensive planning framework that assesses a community's ability to become restorative while also preparing uh, customized roadmaps that guide cities to restorative success. So the next few slides will walk through these, uh, these programs in, in greater detail. So the Nexus Hub itself is more or less a neighborhood sustainability center. Uh, Scott was talking about concepts of urban metabolism and, uh, and, and high performance. And this is really designed to, to really bring that model to life. So more or less, this is a facility that takes waste, captures that as an input to, to generate uh, really valuable uh, services for a local community. So municipal solid waste, wastewater, and agriculture waste are converted within the urban core 
into pure drinking water, renewable energies, ultra-fresh seafood, nutrient-rich fertilizer, and recycled materials. And all of this is happening hyper-locally and within uh, a package, within these uh, physical infrastructure uh, solutions and buildings that are, are part, actually part of really high-quality urban places. So this type of utility is no longer out in the periphery, out in the suburbs, and at this very large-scale centralized, but it's much more a localized and integrated and systems-based. So we basically vetted these technologies that are a part of the, the Nexus very diligently across, uh, excuse me, skipped ahead, uh, across a couple of these parameters. So the first is really looking at, again, the level of integration, ensuring that these operate within a closed loop. And like a living system, all, all waste is a part of a, a closed loop system so that that waste becomes a food. Uh, we're also looking at the level of performance, that these are all market-tested and leading-edge technologies, not bleeding-edge, but these are all uh, on the market. And so uh, people can be at comfort with that level of, of them being all proven. And then third, uh, the third factor is really looking at the siting applications of these technologies and really focusing on having them fit within a small footprint so they can be in the urban core and even be part of mixed-use buildings, and also that they have zero pollution. So again, they they're ideal for, for that urban siting. And sort of looking at this from a different angle, the, the, the implications of this hub and this type of uh, integrated utility facility, is that this really embodies a new business model where uh, if you look again at a conventional uh, resource delivery system that, that cities and communities utilize, it's really kind of single function, centralized uh, approach, and it uses a lot of re to deliver these services. And a lot of this uh, distribution costs as far as the amount of energy required to move water around and amount of water to, to create energy, so on and so forth. These systems aren't speaking to each other. So what this is essentially doing is taking a lot of these core functions and putting them into a single facility, which is really accessible within a single investment opportunity. So it's providing a lot of that functionality performance in uh, with far less resources and environmental impacts. The second element of this integration uh, and, and how it really hits on this, uh, this business model approach is, again, that idea of circular economy. So we're taking waste streams, which are general costs and liabilities that cities spend a lot of money to get rid of, and we're enabling them to be valuable assets and closing those loops and capturing that economy over and over and over again within that community. So this is a tremendous, uh, a tremendous business opportunity. And really recognizing that the facility, the Nexus Hub itself, can't be an island, uh, we basically uh, are recognizing that it can be plugged into a grid, and there are additional integration opportunities at the district and community scale. So the hub plus the grid ultimately creates an integrated utility system. And this is looking at energy and water and waste and IT and even elements of mobility infrastructure and optimizing those as a unified system. So we're looking at the coordinated installation and management of these uh, grid components, and also uh, you know, their ability to uh, you know, be embedded within a similar business model so that service uh, offering for the community can be, can be bundled and packaged to create far greater value than what's being, being realized right now. And this really uh, represents a highly resilient, resource productive community. And uh, it's the foundation for a smart city so smart buildings can plug into the smart grid. Essentially, every building is automatically green on this type of grid. So it, it's a really transformative solution that helps communities realize these ambitious goals far faster than uh, an, an incremental sort of building by building approach that we're really utilizing right now. And kind of zooming out a little bit more, I, I just touched on the business model, but let's really kind of learn a little bit more about, kind of, again, the current conventional development model, and it's important to really recognize that this is a failing business model, that the way that we're doing this from a linear take-make-waste resource management approach, again, that sort of single function dispersed and siloed uh, management, uh, is, it's not working, and we're just feeding the meter on this right now. The American Society of Civil Engineers, every four years they come up with a report card of American, America's infrastructure, and the most recent report basically identified that across all these different elements of uh, infrastructure, 
there's an average score of a D plus, and there's $3.6 trillion worth of investment required, not to improve it, but to maintain it at the state that it's in right now, by 2020, so within the next four to five years. And they're also recognizing that about half of this, about two trillion, is uh, unaccounted for. It's a funding gap. So this is really critical to really look at this macro perspective of, you know, just as the, this is the model that we continue to work on, and it's not, uh, it's not functional. And we're looking at communities like Flint, Michigan, that are a product of this dysfunction, and recognizing that's probably not an anomaly, and that there's going to be many more communities like this into the future. Sorry, a train is coming by right now. So it's really important just to really understand that uh, that this this needs to be tri fundamentally shifted, and cities are really at the heart of this. They make up about two percent of the land mass of the built environment of, of the the global environment and utilize about 75% of the, the global resources. So they're highly intensive uh, resource uh, consumers and then they just basically con convert that into, into waste. So our grand vision is essentially to look at the same scale and look at the same resources needed and then have more of a distributed model that uh, manages uh, resources locally within this integrated utility system. So this basically makes the city itself uh, resilient and resource productive. And again, focuses on the high quality places that Charles is going to talk about in more detail uh, in a few minutes. So uh, it's really based off of high quality places. And then also supporting a uh, community's ability to finance and support these nexus and integrated utility solution solutions is the Restorative Infrastructure Fund, which is a program of ours that uh, basically utilizes public and private uh, financial mechanisms and, and means that are out there and, and channels them into these restorative projects. So there's federal loan guarantees, there's EB-5 centers that invite capital from other parts of the world. We can utilize resources such as carbon markets and stormwater credits. And uh, from some of the preliminary assessments of what these uh, financial resources are available, we've identified there's uh, tremendous opportunities to support this type of project. Uh, project and infrastructure solution, and uh, the available mechanisms can even offset up to 40% of the capital uh, going into the Nexus Hub and the integrated utility system. So a lot of uh, tremendous saving opportunities available. So that was a quick overview of the hardware element of our value proposition of this turnkey approach. I'm going to spend a, a minute or two looking at the uh, complementary software, which is the Ecala Insights uh, planning platform. So this essentially looks at a city's ability to become restorative and it assesses it through a, a really high level and targeted benchmarking and it also provides custom implementation path, path, pathways for a community to realize its goals. And so uh, and a pillar of the platform is the restorative city standard. This is a document that more or less provides the vision, goals, and imperatives of what a net positive community would look like. And it's very holistic. It looks at the environmental resources of a community, energy, water, waste, materials, food, uh, the, the, how those assets are managed from the IT, the access and mobility, uh, the economics of that city, the um, quality of life, and then that really spills over into the identity of place. So the restorative city standard really looks at this all in relationship of each other and the integration and identifies that this can really become a virtuous cycle if it's managed effectively. And then with the goals established within the city standard, uh, the Insights platform really works to illuminate baseline conditions from which improvements can be made. So it has really targeted uh, benchmarking. So this uh, grid right here on the left of the image uh, really looks at a spectrum of development opportunities and puts development in context. And as you'll see here, this line in the middle is sustainable, and that's a zero point. That's sort of the, the transition, the pivot point from the net negative to the net positive. And so we've created a, a metric system that actually guides communities across those 12 performance areas of the restorative city standard uh, to uh, basically map where they are and assess where they are, and then uh, suggest improvements to be able to ascend along the spectrum. And so. Uh, most communities right now are at this conventional space, which is this negative 50 point. And uh, really, 
this is important to recognize that we're working out of this deficit and we have tremendous uh, distance that needs to be made to be able to achieve these net positive goals. And so uh, basically we take uh, hundreds of data points from a community across those 12 performance areas and we're able to calculate them within in the spectrum and then uh, it creates a specific single community footprint. So in this light, this, this tool is really like a city diagnostic tool, really uh, acknowledging the health of that community. So recognizing that this information is really helpful in, in, in a digestible and, and a format that enables people to access it and, and build off of it, the platform also supports the uh, integrated reporting and it creates customized uh, implementation pathways that even incorporate uh, the Nexus Hub and integrated utility systems. And for projects uh, that are uh, basically assessed within the performance standard within uh, a score above zero, we can give voluntary credit, a voluntary certification for those programs. So that is basically the, uh, the overview of the approach. And the, that really kind of looks good in theory, but what does it look like in practice? Uh, we, last year we worked with Scott and his team and, and really did an assessment of a 260-acre district in San Francisco, which is called Central Somo. And this is a development site that uh, is right on the edge of downtown. It's going to support massive growth in the next uh, decades, additional 20,000 new residents and 80,000 new jobs uh, going in this district. And it has a goal of being the first regenerative neighborhood in San Francisco, so very, very ambitious. So basically the first thing we did within the scope of work is uh, to identify those baseline conditions. So we did that insights assessment. Across all those 12 performance areas, we did that, score, that, that assessment to identify what the scores are. And across all these sort of uh, environmental elements, we identified, you know, there's a range between conventional and green. Uh, so energy would have a negative 35 score and water negative 33. And this, is, this was not really that surprising because we recognized as we we're understanding what the, in, the in community and infrastructure looks like right now, it's fairly conventional. A lot of uh, fossil fuels that are being imported from, uh, from the surrounding regions. Water is still very centralized and it's drawn from uh, snow melt from a, a reservoir at way upstream which is not a replenishable source. Food is, uh, again, a lot of that's imported and there's food deserts within the community. And then we also looked at elements like land use and planning and the government system uh, and how that spills over into the health and well-being and culture and identity. And so this assessment really gave us a lot of uh, intelligence on really how well positioned this district and, and San Francisco itself can realize its regenerative goals. And we basically came up with a scorecard here where the, the, the district had a score of negative 32. And so we presented this in front of the, the planning team and they were like, wow, uh, we thought we, did, we thought we had a higher score than that. Like negative 32 really feels like we're in that deficit. But again, it really helped expose that critical gap as far as you know, where they are today and what they need to, to be able to achieve those regenerative goals that they established for themselves. And it also really recognized that this incremental sort of net negative approach of just tweaking buildings and working more at that scale and, and just uh, you know efficiency based efforts are really not going to be able to to be enough to uh, achieve these goals while there's rapid development taking place. So it gave us the great uh, insight that we have to do something more transformative, which happens to be something like uh, a Nexus Hub and an integrated utility system. So the second half of this, uh, this scope of work we did for the district was uh, really looking at what a customized uh, Nexus Hub, integrated utility hub would look like. So we uh, really set to understand what the, the infrastructure requirements would be for that district and uh, identified that there would be 5 million gallons a day of wastewater produced within the community. So we identified that as a really valuable input for the system also supplement about 150 tons of organic waste puts through the, the generation gener uh, waste energy with digest technologies were used we could 12 megawatt clean electricity could go back to the grid or uh, we could actually take electricity utilizing off-peak 
convert that into hydrogen for a 21st renewable energy fleet, and that would power about 7,500 vehicles. And also how we're looking really at uh, food in the community, about a million pounds of seafood, four million lettuce, community which would feed uh, 100,000 people uh, for their lettuce. Uh, addressing some of those issues that are within uh, and we've really recognized integration, and it's a big sided in core. We model it to be able to fit within two acres or even within a mixed use development with Central Soma. That we could enable the disc to really achieve a lot of these aggressive goals the zero waste, its uh, recycled water goals, and uh, renewable energy and carbon reductions. So, this facility would offset a couple hundred thousand tons of carbon a year. It would uh, really help catalyze the renewable energy with goals within the district. And uh, also, at the full public, recognize this could be sort of the anchor for uh, an ecotourism district within the community. And so uh, you know, having this be one of the first examples of really next generation 21st century urban regenerative innovation, we calculated there could be about 10 to 20 million dollars worth of uh, ecotourism uh, available from People wanting to come and visit this from around the world. So a lot of tremendous opportunity of kind of being an early adopter with this type of approach. We also did some uh, financial modeling of this facility. So this system cost would be about $183 million as models. And so uh, within the financial performer we put together, uh, we amortized the system very rapidly in 10 years, so essentially like a 10-year mortgage. And based off of the circular economy that I was mentioning before, how quickly we can take a cost and turn it into an asset, the, in addition to paying off its, its mortgage, the system would accumulate about $60 million of prod, uh, profit within the first 10 years. And then after that, that mortgage is paid, essentially the revenue, the profit goes uh, way, uh, accelerates a lot faster. So we modeled that there would be about $380 million uh, available uh, for that community if it's kept kept within, within the district. So a lot of opportunity to do something uh, like the integrated utility system and have that spill over into other elements of the grid and the community infrastructure that's required to, uh, to connect to the community so that these services are, are delivered to the customers within that community. And so from the integrated utility system perspective, we identified a lot of opportunity particularly around a, a repair, a street repair program, so all the main streets are going to be ripped up in the next 20 years. There's already a lot of purple pipes, which is the recycled pipes, that are being uh, uh, utilized within the district so we can connect to those and, and build out that program. There's also regenerative and eco-district planning frameworks and zonings uh, within, the, within San Francisco and the district alone. So that's kind of a quick summary of, of the utilization of this turnkey approach. and really kind of recognizing what ECALA, what we're being recognized uh, for uniquely is uh, this, uh, uh, this really next generation, highly curated, turnkey, uh, integrated approach where uh, it represents an, a multiple benefit, profitable utility business model. So it's replacing this current failing business model and it's not uh, you know, an abrupt transition, but we can actually phase this very early so that we're taking again, the costs and the liabilities from the existing model, the waste, and just seeing that into new economic revenue streams. And, and so the IUS integrated utility system is a smart renewable grid, and uh, it makes these aggressive goals very achievable with less effort. The Insights platform is uniquely designed to guide communities to success, and this is really where we meet communities up front, is enable them to customize and work with policies, work with their uh, stakeholder engagement, and, and really customize a solution specifically for them. And this is all often and ready for prime time, so we're looking for partner uh, city developments. And with that, I'm going to pass this over to Charles, who has some really inspiring uh, slides and, and ideas to share on, on uh, regenerative districts and, and how that can be delivered. Uh, so I'm going to switch it to him. Uh, really appreciate the attention.
Charles, are you, are you on mute? This is Joe. How about now? Is that better? Perfect. Yep, you're good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I want to thank Josh and Scott uh, uh, for, um, for setting up uh, this part of the presentation. This, part, this presentation um, will deal mainly with uh, some tools that we're finding that support uh, this regenerative notion um, at the district scale, and it's based on our, high, high, our, our planning and designing of these high-performance districts. And one of the main things that we've learned is that uh, great places that people appreciate and are meaningful uh, that, are, that get that uh, quality of experience because of the regenerative design are, um, have a great power in the market and have um, a really answer the who cares and why bother uh, question about why regenerative design is likely to occur. And, and I'm going to go over a couple of tools that we use that are common in the market and how they're organized, um, can be organized to, to fit in with this regenerative model um, that, and the pivot. For us, the district scale is important because there's an economy and ecology up here that is shared by how occupants use high-performing business buildings and how they use high-performing landscapes. And when taken together, you recognize that there's only so much a building can do by its own, on its own, how it connects to others, how it uses the open space, and how occupants use all that together is critical to the success and that efficiency. Uh, and I think uh, Joshua really nails it when he says there's things that you can do um, to the utility service uh, that gives you an economy of scale at a district scale because there's many more subscribers. And at an ecological scale, those occupants can optimize their activities collectively um, to share base waste byproducts uh, in a way that gives you a, a save, so much savings that it can help pay for many of the visual, tangible benefits that people appreciate and will strive for because they're taking this pivot. One of the things that we recognize is that tools that are, deal with things that will be made visible and will be brought to the surface and contribute to meaningful uh, visual presence in people's lives are supported by invisible um, technologies and services that have to be organized. And what we found in our work uh, over, the, over the years is that goal setting across the visible and invisible is really important because once you understand what goals you want to achieve, then you can make configurations of the urban area that support those goals. And if you do that well enough, people will volunteer to support you in how they will organize themselves to, and govern themselves and create an organization to share costs with each other and sustain this development over time. This comes um, from an experience, um, although I was only 12 when this happened, uh, 40 years ago, um, Portland um, had to set some goals because in, in a cathartic way, they were out of compliance with air quality, they were out of compliance with um, water quality, and quite frankly, their city was providing not much civic um, uh, value to people's lives because everyone was driving away in their cars. As the cars came downtown and took over the city, um, the, the utility was reduced and they took a transformative idea to pivot to a new city configuration to meet those goals by moving people out of the car and into a transit system that was supported by open space um, design that made a destination that was desirable and reasonable to that, that would compete for the total trip door to door using transit with equal, equal in value and experience as taking their car. Uh, they did some other things too that were hidden like they put a cap on <coughs> parking uh, ratios. Um, but the most visible improvement were the imp open space improvements that came as a consequence as they started to get rid of cars, they could get rid of roads, and that they could turn roads into parks. And this notion that the open space created this transfer, trans, this configuration of the city that contributed to this open space system was then so highly valued in the community that the community, particularly the neighborhood associations who were downtown and the business associations who were benefits of increased commercial activity, became supporters and investors uh, and created new kinds of business improvement districts and community associations to support that development. So I wanted to say that there's a real hope in my mind that we can apply tools in ways to support this 
um, this pivot, provided that the goals and the settings or configuration we make to, create, to achieve those goals have enough of a tangible, visible benefit and meaningfulness and purpose in people's lives, in addition to saving money, in addition to saving money, that they would be willing to share the cost and those benefits, those benefits with each other and with others. But I think Josh makes the great point that we need to internalize those costs and keep them circulating in the community and not being externalized to the extent we can. So, what, so I'll show you some tools um, within each of the goal, configuration, and governance structures that I think are important to consider and give rise to the optimism that we have at this district scale. First of all, the foundational piece is, is that you need to be giving the community a stake uh, and an ability to participate and invest in and benefit from what planning is being, what is being, what is occurred. They have to see and feel it and be wed to it. So it's not public relations anymore, it's community, it's public engagement. Next thing is that when we're looking uh, at a kind of a newer idea that I think is getting a lot of traction is called complete streets, which is looking at streets for more than just the conveyance of uh, all nodes. Uh, but making it and transforming it into a smarter street that not only deals with mo you know, connectivity and mobility, but makes and organizes the watershed in that, 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 wa that, um, that, um, that right-of-way to clean, process, store stormwater, to, to use plants to evapotranspirate that stormwater, but form the aisles of movement that also support programmed events and engage with community activities that are at the building. So if that's, oh, we, maybe we should set more goals for our, you know, broader goals for our, for our streets. Similarly, when we're thinking about planning density and locating uses, um, maybe it's not enough to have uses in proximity. Maybe it's that they need to have the right, a certain density. Maybe they need to be around 5 FER. Maybe we need to have as many people there during the day in that district as at night and maybe the jobs, the four jobs to housing uh, ratio is about right so that you have enough people in the day using resources such as an office who's generating heat as it makes cooling, that that heat could be stored and used by the residents that evening and that that way we're, we're economizing on the amount of energy that's being used and sustaining it in the district for longer periods of time. And the water follows suit and the other thing that follows suit is the vitality in the district when there are about equal amounts of people in the district throughout the day creates business and services that in a great intensity that is more desirable. So if you if you make a set these goals and those things are to be achieved, um, you, you need to be in, and you engage with the community, then you can create a governance structure and there's some tools here that we do already and the things that we can use probably more and more more less and, and more extensively. On the foundation level is just getting partner, finding out what you share and finding out how to share those costs and benefits to some type of public-private partnership. And that's probably foundational to any of these district schemes. We also need to be thinking about additional standards we would apply to ourselves where the, even the, the, the actions of each building in a district can make a contribution to a district um, without even regulating it. They just agree uh, to coordinate themselves. Um, in the way that they develop each street, they would be responsible for capturing, cleaning the stream water, uh, or at least pre-treating the storm water to create a new kind of environment. That they might also <laughs> be concerned about the biomass and the picking species, et cetera, that contributed to uh, um, uh, a bio biodiversity. And then finally, if they clean the water on the streets and they clean the water on the buildings, and the water that they're collecting is not needing to be treated very much to be reused. And so it's in their interest to clean the water uh, collectively before they reuse it and before they uh, collect it and mix it with other water. And then finally, um, the regenerative uh, piece that I think we're just beginning to understand, particularly if you've been looking for Pokemons in your neighborhood, is that sensing and modifying human behavior by giving occupants the ability to see data streams to, uh, and then share uh, as well as to, to, to modify their own uh, behavior and, and, and use of resources, but also being able to see activity in the community that, that, that they want to be, they want to, or seeing uh, where, knowing where activity is in the neighborhood that they can go and use all the amenities in the neighborhood 
and seeing the neighborhood as a, or a district as a vast repository of, of places one can migrate to because they have information at the right scale is, is going to be a transcendent opportunity to create and maintain activity. So I'll just talk about the configurations where some of these concepts lie that are in our experience. Uh, the foundational piece is probably in our early work in the Pearl District that was to establish a housing area in a, in a defunct railroad um, intermodal exchange uh, district that where housing was going to be developed to, to get people living and working in the downtown area. And it required a partnership between the property owner of the railroad, the city, and um, many of the other businesses to, to, to connect that uh, neighborhood with other business districts vis-a-vis -a, -vis a new technology, which was streetcar. That required not only that there would be some benefit in the lives for the people who moved to this re recycled railroad yard, but it, that it made an amenity for the, the region as a whole and completed the city. And that there's enough reason for the city to contribute because they got the housing and affordable housing that they needed in close proximity to downtown, but they got a new mode of transportation and in exchange for that, they were giving uh, development entitlements to the developer and paying money and, and establishing a urban renewal district to finance this development, which in the end paid itself all back and more, getting back to Josh's point about there being uh, uh, a return on investment in, uh, in a, over a 15-year period, very short time frame. But the real, uh, real magic is that it, it set a standard for what kinds of places in cities are desirable and what we should be shooting for as we're making sustainable districts that have a real purpose and meaning. The next one is the South Africa district, which was built on the idea that 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 federal properties could achieve um, uh, federal buildings could achieve net zero as measured by carbon um, it, for all buildings that were planned and built after 2020 to be net zero ready to be net zero as measured by carbon by 2030. So meeting Obama's federal leadership in environmental energy and economic performance uh, executive order, CGF and ERA and HRNA developed a plan where we identified how these systematic district scale improvements could save and achieve these uh, federal mandates. Uh, we did it by recognizing that there was plenty of development potential that was unused and that the building, some buildings could remain and be repurposed, and that new buildings with new uses uh, could be built, and that each building had a, a role and a responsibility in achieving their targets for resource use, um, and that in that we could establish uh, meaningful strategies and uh, organize, organize a configuration that increased the population uh, by 33%, increased vehicle, I mean, uh, reduce, increased peak hour transit trips and increase and improve the density of development and its mix so that we could get that was those were all required in order to meet that CO2 carbon uh, goal. But the signature piece of this that was how the open space system became a nexus for for treating and managing energy and water for reuse. And the stormwater credits here pretty much paid for most if not all of the surface improvements that were related to the water, but we got an added benefit because that spine along 10th Street became a heat exchange uh, area that was connected to our aquifer, where our aquifer was not only heat exchange for ground source heat and cooling, but it was also a destination for our potable water. And we were able to generate a concept for a net positive water system, which is clearly regenerative in, and in, in not, not frequent in most cities, but in this city it was possible. Finally, I'll talk to you about what I think is an example of a regenerative city that we're working on in Japan that is focused on resiliency um, and reducing, uh, dealing with a multi-generational uh, integration of families in dense urban areas, population decline, and improving economic output. And in that, they, the national government created this smart city concept, uh, and that part of the district designated as a smart city was developed mostly in residential around a station area that was on the Scuba Express about 30, 35 minutes north of Tokyo next to Chiba University, University of Tokyo, a National Institute of Cancer Research, and a, a large Hitachi Research District. 
And this was going to be an area where jobs and housing could be mixed and that there would be a societal benefit because new kinds of spaces that were active in the daytime and nighttime could be achieved. The basis for many of its successes in being resilient was an area energy management system, much like the one that, um, that uh, Josh talked about, where they could um, store and manage and collect uh, resources, whether it's heating and cooling from the earth or the air, or store and power off-peak or um, in batteries that would allow them to be off the grid for up to three to four days after an unplanned natural disaster or unplanned disaster. But the key thing here was that they had a forward-facing application program interface that allowed neighbors and community members to see their own personal use of resource and thereby they were, um, they were given targets for them to achieve and if they did, they would get credits to use in the local stores, and they, which helped gamify their resource use efficiency. Um, then they had displays and kiosks throughout the district that allowed you information to what kind of activities were going on in the area and what kinds of uh, events, particularly if there's an unplanned natural disaster, this would be a, a quick way for everyone to understand what and what, what, where, where places of refuge would be. Our role in this process was to find and create value in the open space system between the buildings that were built today and would be built in the future that held meaningful purpose for the community as an active and vital outdoor space that could be programmed and um, create, a sort of, if you will, a third place outside of the building that made connections between and sustained connections between the business and the uh, residential community. Uh, after our workshop, uh, several workshops and, and an eco-district vision process and over the last three years um, of sustained um, support of this uh, new idea is that they wanted a new Keshwanaha life, lifestyle that took nature and the benefits of vegetated systems to cool and create settings for different activities and to process water um, with earth, that high intensity urban services and programmable space that if those things were desirable enough, which was, we were on the hook to prove, that the community and business interests would share uh, in those and create and sustain it in a governance structure, which they had already sort of they already had in place. So they became excited about how buildings could be redesigned so that there was a transparency between inside and outside, and there was more dialogue between inside activities and outside activities, and that the services would be located along Key Street, and there would be sort of a set front in front of all buildings rather than set back and that there would be a connection between occupants inside and outside. There was a sense that there would be a continuity of green space and green infrastructure that connected a, a basically a majority increase in office uses that would be integrated and research facilities that are integrated into uh, uh, re residential communities. And that they formed different districts. One was a commons area in the center where business and, and community interests could share recreational facilities, and then there was a garden area that had sort of small-scale office built with residents, and then there was a town area that was a little bit more kind of uh, uh, more varied in, in the types of businesses that it could accommodate as long as it made a, a proper open space system. It had a link to the station that was recognized and valued, and it had a, a loop that connected these different people during the day who were working and living in the district. But the key part of it was is that we wanted to have a transformed front yard, if you will, that was where they could have community activities and businesses to thrive, providing support to business and community members in this district throughout the day and, and really generate some energy throughout the day during the day, and literal and figurative energy in the district. So it goes back to this diagram, which I think has real value when we're thinking about the pivot, is thinking about the seen and unseen, but recognize that what is seen by the neighborhood is what will be inspiring to bind them together, something that they would share and pursue together, um, and that when you make that space, it should be a readable environment that they see all of the improvements that are contributing to that, that sustainable pivot. And that by virtue of those that you see, you differentiate yourself in the market and you attract and, uh, more value to your development because you have more people who are just desiring such type of lifestyle. So for me, it seems like we can be optimistic as long as Scott and Josh are successful in their endeavors and their interests as well. So 
So I'm going to shift now back to Scott. Which I believe I'm doing. Yes, I think you... Oh, here we go. Sorry. Okay, I think we're up. Well, Josh and, um, and Charles, thank you very much. I'm always um, completely engaged whenever I hear your presentations, uh, even multiple times. And I, I think that um, they really illustrate that this innovation is very rich, that it's in play, and that it illustrates where these big ideas about sustainability go when you actually start uh, applying them. So what I'd like to do right now is kind of bring us to a close and shift us into the Q&A period just with a little reflection on um, what the pivot challenge means and the new business model utility, integrated utility challenge means and what the um, regenerative urban design uh, means for planning. I mean, because planning doesn't do those things per se, but it enables them. And so for planning, I think, again, it means, you know, getting into a place where we can really lead um, this innovation to its fruition. It involves learning more about it. It would involve doing our regulatory business a little differently. It would involve raising the bar so we can actually get there. Um, part of this is going to be because a lot of it's, doesn't yet exist. It's going to need to be invented, and that's going to be invented through innovation. And somehow we need to figure out a way to enable routine innovation for regeneration in our routine work of project development, review, and approval. And a lot of that's going to involve convening the new conversations that will actually enable that. Um, so we've got this leadership role, getting into it a little deeper point is to create this new value and this new regenerative economy. Um, we require understanding the regenerative system performance imperatives more deeply and understanding how they imply uh, particular goals, urban planning goals, comp plan goals that we would need to put into place. Um, developing the policy support for this regenerative performance that, we, um, that has the higher value and to convene the collaboration uh, across sectors as needed, maybe even identifying particular investment opportunities that have high public regenerative development value and, and targeting those as um, kind of anchor uh, initial <coughs> low-hanging fruit foci that really uh, start moving the ball. And again, to innovate routinely with research and demonstration projects. So in terms of actions, um, these things might involve preparing a strategic city action plan to figure out how to achieve this restorative whole city system performance. Maybe reflecting the regenerative principles and RFPs and RFQs, approving projects based on regenerative performance, not prescriptive standards, creating higher value by working across multiple scales, which is another key uh, theme you saw there, and then using um, the off-the-shelf innovations that have already been proved elsewhere. And a lot of that involves some information and really illuminating those on a mainstream way. <clears throat> um, what you see in front of you is the uh, new Transit Center Park in San Francisco that's being built right now at the corners of First and Mission Street. And this new Transit Center, the roof of the Transit Center is going to have this park. We can, you can actually buy off-the-shelf sustainability right now if you know what you're looking for, which requires some learning, and who to buy it from. Um, there's a whole cadre of leading um, architects and engineers and designers out there that are doing this uh, on a routine basis, Charles being one of them. Um, so in terms of wrapping up did, today, did we eliminate the challenge, the need for this pivot, planning's emerging regenerative regenerative response, our method in terms of amplifying and recognizing and pivoting, and this value position of leapfrogging to sustainability by creating better places through regenerative design and really that enabling uh, the creation and transition to a sustainable economy. 
So in terms of discussion ideas, we might reflect a bit on how all of this resonated, um, your actual experience with regenerative urbanism, because it's going on in lots of different places, uh, the degree of interest and engagement of yourself, maybe your colleagues, your city, um, key opportunities and barriers to, to making these moves, and what we might do differently back at our offices in 20 minutes or so, uh, or tomorrow or the next week, and et cetera. And then, you know, for certain things that are, could use some support, how the APA and the, uh, the Sustainable Communities Division could actually support uh, you. So on that note, I just want to thank everybody for uh, listening today. And we've got some contact information that will stay up here uh, for a bit. And I'm going to hand this over to, um, to uh, Christine. OK, great. Thank you. Yeah, just keep your screen up, um, and I'll just kind of chime in here. Yeah. We, uh, we definitely have questions, so I'm just going to kind of start get them off and see what we can get through. Um, this first question is for Josh. Um, how does the hub deal with heavy metals and other contaminants in the waste streams? Yeah, great question. So the technologies, the partners that we're, we're utilizing are, are definitely industry leading. And so these are uh, issues that they've are overcoming right now from the materials recovery technology it has the highest purity rates that's available on the market and from the anaerobic digestion if we're looking at the organics from the wastewater and even the organic stream from food waste and so on and so forth there are a lot of heavy metals and uh, those are definitely processed within within the technologies and the water purification element has also uh, taken wastewaters to levels that exceed the federal drinking water standards. So these critical issues that are particular to urban environments are, are all being addressed with what we're working on. OK, thank you. Um, Scott, you're up. Um, in, in the first portion of your presentation, uh, you departed from the premise that we are at the end of the industrial age that may be true for the U.S., but not so much for the rest of the developing world. How can the first world stop transferring the problems of the industrial age to the rest of the world and enable regenerative urbanism there? Great question. <clears throat> um, I think kind of that gets to the heart of the pivot um, because I, you know, I mean, one of the things to recognize about sustainability is that not only is it a kind of a good idea and kind of something we need to do, but it's also a better business model. It's also a better economy. And so the idea here would really be to harness um, this regenerative approach and the pivot to really leapfrog not only within the United States, but globally uh, from, you know, business as usual, which is exporting a lot of these problems through our traditional uh, development models to a regenerative approach and a regenerative model. And so, you know, there's implications um, across international practice, there's implications across international aid and development programs, um, and that's really where we want to, that's what we want to reward in terms of human capital development, um, both on an educational basis, but also in terms of of the types of skills and services that um, the plan design and build profession offers. Um, so I know that's kind of a very general idea and answer, but uh, basically the regenerative approach and this pivot net positive sets up a new model for um, international development as well. And in fact, you know, meeting, you know, 90, something like 90, 85 or 90 percent of the population increase projected between now and 2050 is in the developing world. And so they're facing these challenges in a hyper way. And um, really, we need to kind of take these concepts and get to proof of concept and get to routine uh, infrastructure, production, and design concepts so we can actually create this one new city uh, of one million per week for the next 50 years, as well as transform the existing urban fabric. Thank you. Uh, this next question I think could be answered by everyone, but let's start with um, Charles. We'll put you in the hot seat. 
Um, about half of Americans live in municipalities of fewer than 25,000 people. Smaller cities, suburban, rural towns. How might all these ideas translate for those uh, population groups? That's a good question. I think that there's uh, technology is changing, and right now, um, like for um, five or six years ago, we thought you couldn't do an anaerobic digester unless there's about 40,000 people. But now technology has changed, and you can do it for about 10. I, I think that when we made one of the things to re remember is that um, every community is a little different in what their cathartic change that they need to make may be. It may be water insecurity. It may be um, lack of fuel. It may, it may be um, um, ch challenges with inequity. You know, there's just no jobs, and so there's the decline in value. And I think that we have to see each one of those communities for what it is, and each one of them has to sort of establish uh, what kind of goals that they want to achieve and how they want to pivot um, together. Um, so I, I guess the short answer is that it depends, but the, the better answer is, is that things are changing rapidly. And I think things, technology is getting scaled down that, and uh, it's just whether or not those communities are interested in um, sharing things that they do. Can I, can I piggyback on that really quick? This is Josh. Yeah. Uh, Oh yeah. Okay, Everyone. great. Thank you. So, yeah, we've we've done some work with some smaller rural towns as well, and there are actually some really unique advantages that they provide, particularly uh, resource access, a lot more space. Their their energy demand and load is significantly smaller. So, being able to achieve these restorative or net positive goals, it's fairly uh, fairly actionable, uh, and a lot of times it's a much simpler decision making process. You don't have nearly as many stakeholders the city council can come and just make a decision very quickly. And so if there is a hunger and a desire to utilize uh, an approach like this, and you know the infrastructure model that integrated utility system and Nexus are perfectly suited for smaller towns as well. In fact, even touching on the question for Scott, we, we did a, a prototype, a mock-up for the Gates Foundation, utilizing uh, a broad swath of market-based data from uh, Africa. I know it's a huge, huge variance there, but we're basically able to determine that even utilizing those raw numbers that uh, this approach is productive and it has a simple return on investment of less than five or six years. And so it's a market-based solution even in the most stringent markets around the world. So that's a testament to how versatile and viable this is as we, as we consider it for the future. Yeah, and maybe just to kind of piggyback on both those responses, I mean, I think, you know, part of the challenge of sustainable development is you know, doing it in the context of scarce resources, scarce time, scarce knowledge about how to do it. And so when we're looking at existing communities or even existing neighborhoods, for instance, in San Francisco, as opposed to new development or redevelopment where you've got big money coming in, um, you know, somehow the answer has to be, end up being merged with the reinvestment in the existing built environment that goes on over a 20, 30, 40, 50 year period, as well as the infrastructure. And so, you know, the short answer is that it might not happen for a while, but at that point when you're rebuilding, when you're replanning, when you're reinvesting in new infrastructure, that's the point it would go in. And then the only question is really, is, is, is there a a social benefit to accelerating that point, and are there ways to make that work financially? Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about lead first for a moment. Uh, the question is, uh, what are your opinions on on lead standards? Is this a good starting off point? Uh, do they just not go far enough? Um, thoughts uh, for anyone? Charles, you want to feel this one first? It, can you just repeat the first part of the, the topic? Sure. I um, I just talking about lead, um, it, oh. your opinion, uh, or what is your opinion on the lead standards, and are they a good starting off point? Do they go far enough? Things like that. I, I, I think that uh, leads a role uh, in organizing um, a, you know, non-governmental regulation or just non, just organizing activities either within a building or groups of building is getting, is, in version four is very good. Uh, we just, we took Cashman Noha 
is going to be a certified through version uh, lead ND version four and working extensively in, within that, they're they're, they're requiring um, credit. You know, credits are required on things that are meaningful to be make better places and improve resiliency across a district. Now, uh, I think it's worth looking at lead ND, looking at it again. Um, it's kind of hard to understand. I think it's not, it's sort of impenetrable in some ways. It's not as, you have to sort of be in the business to understand that value. Um, and I think that, you know, presentations like this where we're trying to find an approach to deal with questions um, is more important really to bind community interest than um, focusing on lead in the front end, mainly because I think you need to have, recognize that lead is a certification tool that helps you recognize uh, yourself in the market for things that you do are meaningful and purposeful for your community um, or in, for reducing resource use, uh, improving air quality, or using transforming the, the building industry by pulling out uh, dirty you know, telling, pulling out toxics. Um, so overall I think uh, lead is good, but I, I think the question about the pivot is has to do more with community interest and the cathartic desire to to markedly change the direction in which they build um, so that lead can now start um, measuring your success in this regenerative goal. But it's not doing that just yet. Yeah, this, this is Scott. Um, I, I think the question is a really good question because it kind of gets to the heart of the matter of, of what goals you have and, 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 and how much innovation you're going to initiate. And I, I remember when lead sort of was first being formulated and, and broke onto the, to our stage back in the late 1990s. And um, at the time, it seemed crazy. And, 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 and there was a big question about how much uptake it would get, et cetera. And, and you know, history has proved, us, uh, to, proved it to be wildly successful. But the challenge, as with the Eco District, is what goals do you set? And what's the role of those goals? So lead right now is not going to get you to net positive and regenerative. Um, but the lead system itself does raise the bar internally and intrinsically. And probably in five or 10 years, the regenerative goals and, and methods, et cetera, will be part of lead. Um, and maybe that's the best way to, to leave it at the moment. Okay, um, Scott, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation uh, that social equity is an important part of sustainability. Um, and the question is, a lot of green strategies have ended up being very gentrifying. How can regenerative urbanism be a positive force for social equity? How can those ideas raise up and protect disenfranchised populations and neighborhoods? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's kind of the, uh, the thousand dollar question of, of sustainability is how you integrate uh, equity and social justice in this. Um, I think my personal answer, because that's about as, probably as far as I can take it really, is that um, I sort of focus on the ecological piece and the economic piece because I think that's kind of the core first move. Um, and if it's just embedded, so yeah, so I suppose the answer is, so if it's just embedded in the marketplace, I mean, the market's going to kind of play out the way it normally plays out and, and reinforce, you know, existing advantages and inequalities, et cetera. And so if we just leave it up to the market, you know, that's as far as it will go. I think the challenge for urban planning as a profession is to kind of answer that question and, um, and link regenerative uh, approaches to equity and social justice programs so it really diffuses beyond what the market would uh, do. And I have to say that um, there's a, in San Francisco, there are a number of um, existing um, public housing um, projects that have been around for years that are going through uh, actually a complete um, uh, redevelopment. And I'd be, I'd, and, and, and a lot of the, principles that we've been speaking about, regenerative design, et cetera, are embedded in those proposals and those designs that are being developed. So, you know, those uh, residents will benefit pretty tremendously from these ideas and these concepts because those, those design concepts have been used 
as part of the project planning for those um, those projects. So I guess the answer is kind of like everything else. It really requires some leadership on a policy basis, and that's you know part of what planning does. And building on that really quick, this is Josh. Uh, you know that social element has to be so integrated with uh, with the environmental and resource management, the economic development programs, of course. And uh, it's critical to identify those links and those relationships. And uh, you know, looking at resource access, for example, um, IT as a critical infrastructure uh, alongside energy and water for the 21st century. Access to high-performance internet uh, provides so many foundational resources for communities these days. And, uh, and then embedding that with things like living wages that a community can actually implement at that scale, like Seattle is doing for $15 an hour uh, minimum wage, has a tremendous impact uh, within how that, that community can continue to have their social needs met. Uh, and obviously just the level of high-quality place that Charles was demonstrating you know, there's the elements of biophilia, the natural draw towards living systems. So incorporating that into the planning process is a part of a social justice uh, play. So uh, I think just putting it all on the table, and that's really what we try to do with the, the insights platform, is look at things very holistically. And the social element is, is really vital within that. Thank you. I guess uh, I could, oh, go ahead. Please uh, continue. I was just going to say that we we, we have uh, in Portland's going through a time where there's a lot of displaced or threatened communities and I think that the real challenge is to make there are as we make communities mobile or threaten them we need to have destinations that are reasonable and supportive uh, that address the current market forces we can't ignore it uh, and we need to be thinking perhaps uh, about using the regenerative uh, urbanism concept to be upgrading places where uh, it is affordable to live when certain places become unaffordable. Um, and I, I think that it is a worry that I have about trying to prototype all of these, you know, prototype these regenerative communities and on the, the backs of wealthy invest, you know, and wealthy stakeholders and subscribers. Uh, but I think that there are means by which, as Josh pointed out, um, to, to supplement and complement um, mobile communities uh, through in urban areas. And we need, we need better policies to do that. Yeah, I think these are all good points. This is a really rich point that we could spend a lot of time on. I, I think the only two points I'd sort of close with are that, one, um, uh, you know, there's another dimension to this, which there's two other dimensions to this. One is the idea that, that this regenerative design and these regenerative urbanism concepts and regenerative economy are not just about consumption. In other words, let's design something up and we can consume it, live in it, it's great. But it really involves engagement with a new understanding uh, and, and a new skill set to plug into a new economy. And, you know, so there's that dimension of it that's, I think, important um, as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, it is 2.30 Eastern time, so it's, it's time to wrap up our fun for the afternoon. Um, thanks to the Sustainable Communities Division for uh, hosting and, and sponsoring today's webcast, and of course, Jennifer um, for helping to organize this, and our speakers, Scott, Josh, and Charles for joining us today. Uh, thanks to all of you. And again, um, for any information that you need on this webcast or upcoming webcasts, visit ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Um, you can get links to the PDF of, of this presentation and links to um, a recorded version of it as well. So thanks again to everyone, and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks.